Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Marza Ayati, and I'm going to talk about functional characterization of phosphorylation network and its application in cancer subtyping. So phosphorylation is <clears throat> one of the main post-translational modification, which actually has a really central role in cellular uh, signaling. And uh, so phosphorylation is composed of the network of the kinases that attach the phosphate compound to the protein, phosphatases that they remove the phosphate compound uh, from the protein, and uh, the substrate, which are the target protein. So as you can see here, I don't know, okay, so you don't see my cursor. So uh, over the time with the advancement in mass spectrometry and the tandem mass spectrometry and high throughput uh, analysis, so the number of the phosphocyte that has been identified is increasing rapidly. The blue line here uh, that you can see over the time. And we can identify thousands of the phosphocytes uh, in different experiments. So inspired by the co-expression concept in transcriptomic data and its application, so here we define a um, co-phosphorylation, which, uh, which is basically the correlation between the phosphorylation profile of the phosphocyte across different biological samples. So uh, we use the co-phosphorylation to assess the relationship between pairs of the phosphocytes. For this analysis, we use the by-weight mid correlation instead of typical Pearson correlation. Uh, because it has been shown that it is uh, more robust to the outliers because it is median based correlation instead of the average based correlation. And also uh, it has been shown that it's better than mutual information and other concepts in the uh, co-expression analysis. So in order to investigate how the co-phosphorylation is relevant and have some information in general, we use nine different mass spectrometry databases that are publicly available across different uh, publications. So three of them are uh, breast cancer data sets. Here we report the number of samples that they have in this data, the number of phosphocytes, and number of the proteins that these phosphocytes are mapping to. So we have three breast cancer data sets, two ovarian cancer data sets, one colorectal cancer, one lung cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, and retinal pigmented epithelium. Uh, so we analyze these data sets. The first question that we asked was that, this, does this co-phosphorylation that we are defining contain any functional relevant information. So, so we use different uh, biological knowledge that we have about the pairwise association between the phosphocytes. For example, we use the, uh, so small here. Uh, so we use, for example, if two sites are sharing a kinase, if the same kinase phosphorylating the two sites, can we say that these two sites are more highly to be co-phosphorylated? And uh, or if two sites are residing on two proteins that are physically interacting. So can we say that these two sites are more highly to be co-phosphorylated? And also if two, two sites are co-evolving based on the PTM code database, uh, can we say that these two sites are co-phosphorylated? And if two sites are in the same pathway, what can we say about the co-phosphorylation? So uh, in order to assess the significance of it, we compare these pairs with these specific biological uh, characteristic with the old pairs that we have in all the data sets. And we show that based on this histogram, it might be so crowded, but in general, you can see that uh, if they are bi biologically relevant, so it's more likely that they are co-phosphorylated and highly positively co-phosphorylated. So now that we have, we know that the co-phosphorylation can reflect some biological information about pairs of phosphocytes. So what are the application of it? So inspired by the first one, actually, that the, if two sites sharing a kinase, so they're more likely to be co-phosphorylated, we, develop uh, we developed an algorithm to predict the kinase substrate association. But I'm not gonna talk about it today. I'm gonna talk about the cancer subtyping uh, using the co-phosphorylation. So in 2018, <clears throat> there was this publication that shows that in medulloblastoma, they were, when they were analyzing the proteomics data, they were able to identify some subtypes that they were not visible when you are analyzing the transcriptomic data. So it's, it seems that the proteomic data is higher level, closer to the phenotype, as you saw earlier in the, uh, in the talk. And so they were identifying new subtypes. And then, and then we were inspired to see if phosphoproteomic can actually reveal another subtype. So we have to first uh, show the proof of concept. Can co-phosphorylation actually show any subtyping information? So we developed this framework that basically we created a site-centric network in which we call it actually the phosphocyte functional association network in which the nodes in this network are the phosphocytes. And the connection between these sites 
are coming from different functional association that we know that should be existed between the sites. For example, if the two sites sharing the kinase, if the kinase phosphorylate these two sites, then we put an edge between them in the network. If two sites are co-evolving, then we put an edge between them in this network. If two sites are residing on two proteins that are physically interacting, so then we put an edge between them. So we assume that this, this network that we are creating is going to represent a functional association between all these sites. And then we assign weight to the edges of these networks. And the edge comes from the mass spectrometry-based phosphoproteomic data using the correlation. So we assign weights between the correlate, uh, we assign weight to the edges between every pair. We assign the correlation between every uh, endpoints of every edge uh, as a uh, weight of the edge. And now we have a weighted phosphorylation, uh, phosphocyte functional association network. And then we use our algorithm, module identification algorithm, we call it CopNet, that, uh, that extract, the <coughs> extract the modules from this network. So after we identify these modules so far, we don't use any cancer subtype information in this, right? So this is all unsupervised. And then we evaluate if these identified modules are statistically significant. Are they really meaningful? Are they identified randomly? And even, even random data can give us these modules. And then we evaluate if they are reproducible across different and independent data sets. And then we evaluate if they are associated with any subtypes. And then we also did the kinase substrate enrichment analysis to see if there is any kinase that hyperactivated, hyperactivated in this analysis. So the premise of this approach is that a pair of phosphocytes whose phosphorylation is related to a specific cancer subtype will exhibit the co-variation across different samples. And therefore, co-phosphorylation can actually highlight those cancer-specific modules that we identified. So, so in order to evaluate if those identified modules are statistically significant, what we did is that we randomized the data. We premiered the data and we said, okay, can I identify the same scoring modules in the randomized data? And then we did it 100 times. And uh, we have, oh, before that, I have to say, we apply that framework on two different breast cancer data. Uh, one uh, is from 2017, one from 2016. And so in each of these data sets, we identify modules independently, and then we permute the data, and we identify the modules on 100 permutation data. As you can see in both of these uh, breast cancer one and breast cancer two data set, the top two modules seems to be statistically significant, meaning that they are highly, uh, the score of those modules is highly different from the permuted data. So now that we know these top two modules are statistically significant, we wanted to evaluate if they are reproducible as well. And then for that reason, so we, uh, we investigate if, they are, if there is any overlap between these modules that we identify. As you can see here, the modules that we identify uh, has a significant overlap. Uh, although these two independent data sets are produced in different labs, uh, so these, it shows that these modules are also reproducible. So this is the visual uh, view, which is so blurry here, I don't know why, but um, this is the visual view of the top two modules that we have. So here, the color coded, so far we didn't use any kind of the subtype information, but here for visualization, the color of each node represents the average fold change across, for example, the luminal samples, and across just the basal samples on the right-hand side. So as you can see in module one and in module two, almost half of the modules are dephosphorylated in, across the luminal samples on average, whereas they turned red on the basal samples. So this is actually the visual, you can see how these modules can distinguish between these two uh, subtypes that we have. And here we focus just on the luminal and basal, but we want to actually generalize uh, this method. Then we wanted to evaluate that, are these modules have any prediction power? For that purpose, we just use the SVM classifier and we train the model <coughs> on, the mo on the breast cancer in one of the data sets, breast cancer data set, and we test, <coughs> excuse me, and we test the uh, model on the second breast cancer data set, which is independent data set. And then we show that actually we compare those uh, prediction models with the, when we are using all the phosphocytes or all the significant sites 
and we show that using the modules actually we can improve the accuracy although the number of samples is not really too many but it is basically showing the proof of concept that we can use these uh, for the subtype prediction so as a conclusion the co-phosphorylation we show that the co-phosphorylation can enable assessment of the relationship between pairs of phosphorylation sites across biological context and co-phosphorylation enable identification of the modules that might be correlated to the subtypes and also reproducible and for the future work, we want to generalize this to, uh, to multi-label multi prediction to predict more subtypes and also test it uh, and validate it in other data sets. With that, I would like to thank my collaborator at Case Western Reserve University and NIH for supporting this research. And if there is any question, thank you so much for listening to me. And if there is any question, I would be happy to answer. All right, thanks so much. Uh, Bill, yeah, yeah quick, quick question. question. Yeah. Just a quick question about the, you define the edges using the sort of, I think there were three or maybe four different sources. Yes. You define the presence of the edges and then the weights come from the data, right? Yes. Do you have a sense for which of those sources or the presence of the edges is most important? Can you look back to see if you've got like a sum? Of That's a great question, actually. Yes, we, I, we, when, when we created the network, we, re, we keep removing different edges. And then we see uh, how each edge actually contributes more. So it seems that the pathways are the most important one, and the shared kinase pairs also are the, are the most important one. But, but yes, that's a great question, and we validated, we evaluated the impact of different data in the prediction. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>